We're recording. Hi, everybody. everybody. Welcome to Tsuzame. Hi, Tsipi. Hi, Tsili. Why, why, why? We, so everybody knows that Tsuzame is together. And everybody knows that we do this because uh, I have to repeat myself. We okay. need to be inspired. You see, life is not inspiring enough, right? So we always invite people that we think, we, no, we know that they will inspire us. So therefore, we invited how, how are you winner. Like winner or winner? Winner or winner? Winner. Winner, winner. of course. <laughs> so, you know, you are one of the few I know that is, um, it, it goes from movies to television. And both, you are a screenwriter, you're a director, you're a producer. Are you also a show, you were also a showrunner on television? Not a showrunner, but a writer for film. Okay. Yeah. What is a showrunner? A showrunner is the person who creates a television series, has a vision for the whole arc of okay. the series, and is the one that essentially produces the series, although they have executive producers who do the actual work. But the showrunners are the ones where the buck stops, and they're the ones that uh, hire all of the production team in order to help them fulfill their vision. All right. So that's that's the big the big guy of the whole thing. Right. Or big person. Big, big person. person, right. It can be a female, <laughs> big, female or a male. A guy, it's a male and a female. We won't go to this because it's, it's we mostly feel, males, I think. We but feel never mind. equal with everybody. And I don't like when everybody is mentioning it again and again and again because it's obvious. Oh, so. that it's also men and okay, fine, yeah. fine, fine. Yeah, it's all right. So we're for everybody. Yeah. So um you move from film to television, right? And actually right. One of the things that I, I'm starting almost at the end, but it's okay. Um, what is the future? There is changes in television. There are changes in films. The whole environment. I don't, you know, it's really something is changing. Where are we going? And where this? we are going with this? You know, there's something I want to add to this a little bit because we now uh, ending the two, the second year of the into the corona. But I have a feeling that um, beside the immediate influence and the effect that we have on film and TV, it's going much deeper and further that we cannot really see yet where it takes us. Can you sense something? Well, it's a big question and yeah. nobody has the answer. Everyone's still feeling it out, but I can talk to how some of the changes have manifest. So in uh, the film industry, so few people return to the movie theaters that every studio that was producing movies had to come up with an alternative revenue stream. So they changed what had been the established protocol of releasing a movie and to the theaters that might stay in the theaters for uh, a a few weeks, depending on its success, and then eventually go to some form of cable uh, presentation eight weeks after the uh, initial uh, exhibition in the movie theaters to a uh, format where the, in many instances, the films were released in theaters at the same time that they were released on streaming services. Like because Netflix. everybody was at, a, uh, like, exactly, Netflix, like Amazon, Amazon uh, Prime, right. um, uh, uh, Hulu. So this was a, a, a change in an effort to receive revenue while everybody was locked in their homes. So they'd be able to look at the movies that were being produced. And now... After two years of the pandemic, everyone is accustomed to looking at premier movies in the comfort of their own home. And everybody is still concerned about gathering in any kind it's of a group. And so the theaters have been really taking a strong hit. So like with so many different aspects of life, the, the, the COVID had a big impact in restructuring the business. Now, this has a huge ripple effect because in the studio world, the studios finance the movies and can make any kind of determination about its exhibition. 
But there's a whole other aspect of the business, which is the independent film uh, uh, business, where films are financed by a whole host of independent entities. And the way, way in which those films were financed were that you would get tax incentives in various regions of the world or different states here in the country. Uh, you would get um, uh, foreign sales that uh, estimates of foreign sales that would be um, the basis of which uh, the basis on which a distributor would determine how much money they think they would be able to put forward in financing a movie. And then there would be bank loans based on those estimates of foreign sales that had been um, established by a credible entity. Well, the uh, extent of the foreign sales was many times predicated on whether or not there was a American, a domestic theatrical distribution. So if there was an American theatrical distribution, then the international territories would pay more money for the movie that they were going to purchase for their respective territories. Why? Because if there's a theatrical release, there would be many more dollars that would be invested in marketing that movie and it would become more of a brand and, and then easier for them to sell in their respective territories, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas now, where there's so few movies other than Marvel movies right. and the other big tentpole films that are being produced that are going into the movie theaters, there's not the assured domestic distribution and therefore the foreign territories, our international territories are paying less for um, uh, the use of uh, exhibiting the movies in their respective territories. And that means the budgets for these independent films has to be reduced significantly. What happens in the international territories is that if they're not a, a North American domestic distribution, then the movie will go to television in their respective territories instead of getting a foreign, uh, a, a theatrical distribution. And that is what reduces the, um, the price Harry, that they're willing to pay. The whole process started many more years ago because I remember when people stopped going to theaters. So the theater started to uh, create different environment, you know, to have recliners in some areas, they even had blankets Not many of them. and food. And the whole experience became something else because they were trying to bring the people. But especially because... the young one didn't go to the movies. You know? No, no, no. The Marvel films for the young ones, it's yes. always packed. Right. right. It used to be that the elderly people used to come to the movie because they are from the other, the, the older world, but they stayed home with the corona. So it this takes stages and as if this, the TV screens are getting bigger at home, then people staying home and not coming out. The question is, if you don't screen it on TV, if people will come out and come back to the theaters. I don't think so. Uh, well, the, uh, you know, once again, because we're living in uncertain times, right, about COVID, just think about um, how everyone's concerned about a new variant and still reluctant to go out as much as they wish to do so. Um, they might go to a restaurant, but less so to a movie theater. Yes. Um, it's going to be hard to get people back in the habit of going to movie theaters. You yeah. know, that's not to say that it can't happen, but I don't think that there's any turning back in terms of stopping to show these films on television uh, or on streaming services in order to get people to go back into the movie theaters. I think that ship has sailed personally. Uh, I, I, I certainly could be wrong and who knows what the future brings, but that's just where we are at the moment. Yeah, but you know, I must, I must tell you because it's, it's just happening as we speak. So my film, my feature film, which I wrote, directed and produced myself and she really helped me, uh, was supposed to come out two years ago, just, you know, in J June, two years ago, and then the Corona and everything was shut down. And now it's going to come out this week. Oh, congratulations. Israel for a limited time, and then it's going yeah. to television. But you know, for me, 
who is waiting so much to, and, and I see big screen. I made a movie, I didn't make, we don't have any more, you'll talk about it in a minute, we don't have any more in television movies of the week, right? Mm -hmm. But I, mm -hmm. I made the film for the big screen. So I must tell you, I was very upset until I realized, you know, I should be feel lucky that it's coming out even for a few weeks and then going to television because a lot of films are just disappearing, disappearing because they are independent. Okay, they are serious, you know, like, you know, mine is a friendship between two women, Arab and Jewish. I mean, come on, this is uh, how serious can it get? So if I had to go through a process in accepting the change that you are talking about, you know? Well, listen, I think the biggest challenge for all of us is to accept change. It's, it's a challenge in every aspect of our lives. And we're just talking about one small um, a sliver of, of the way in which changes right. are um, multiplying, you know, right. um, uh, over this period of time. And, and, you know, that's the challenge for us. And I think we have to be resilient. We have to be flexible. We have to be patient. And, and no, with regards to your, 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 your frustration, which is something I completely understand and, and, and share in terms of wanting to see something on the big yeah, screen, yeah. which is a completely different experience. The most important thing is, is that um, the story that you wanted to tell as an audience to hear it. And that's what you have to find I'm peace sure. with. Right, right, it's not an easy one. You know, before we go on, can you be kind enough? Because I could, I could recite, but I want you, uh, just give us examples from the television shows that you did and maybe a movie or two. Just give us a short list. Well. I know it's um, very short because you I, did so much, it's unbelievable. No, I, I think that recently I did a movie with John Renault and Ruby Rose called The Doorman. And before that, I produced a movie uh, with Aaron Eckhart uh, called uh, um, The Expatriate and um, have worked in lots of television series from Alias to uh, Heart to Heart way back when. And uh, um, uh, Veronica Mars and yeah. a, a, a number of other uh, contemporary shows, uh, well, rel relatively recent shows, uh, Dawson's Creek, et cetera. Um, Felicity, uh, and uh, did a movie several years ago called Space Camp, which was the first feature that uh, um, I directed. But, uh, uh, you know, right now I'm developing another movie with Jean Renault, who was uh, in Leon the Professional, uh, a wonderful French actor, um, that we're uh, going to go into production on next year. So do you, when you write, do you, like most of the script, you wrote quite a bit. Was it your idea or you were commissioned? Um, most of the time as a producer, I would look for material and then develop it. That was a promising notion or promising first draft of the screenplay. And then I would work with the writers in order to get it to a place that we could take it into the marketplace. But there were you know, many instances of, of uh, uh, original ideas that I would then create with a writer on spec and then take it into the marketplace. On spec because I knew what- Is not, not being commissioned. Not being commissioned. Right. Um, because I knew what the market was looking for and then I would go forward and, and create it. You know, there was a movie I did that uh, um, I loved for Showtime. I, I, I was born in Detroit and grew up around the time of the Detroit riots in the 60s. And then uh, when I was living in Los Angeles, there was the uh, uh, LA riots in the early 90s. Right. And I realized I wanted to uh, make a movie about it. And um, I took the idea, I had a very specific way in which I wanted to tell that story. And I took that idea to the president of Showtime at the time who was making movies. Um, and uh, uh, he commissioned me to develop it. And, and you know, that's an example of, of uh, you know, then that went on to Telluride and a film festival and, and other areas. It was of, an amazing of, film festival. Yeah. Telluride, yeah. Um, so, so it's just, a, uh, it, it varies. Like I said, there's 
there's many paths to the Buddha. So there's no one way that everything gets done. So what is um, the difference uh, between writing a script for the movies or for television? The difference is the writer. Well, first of all, for, first of all, there's very few movies that are being made for television right now. Right, you know, they're right. more, uh, everything um, has shifted towards limited series ah. or ended television series. You know, when you look, it's, uh, the, the only movies that are being made are movies that are being made not for television in the way in which it used to be the case in the 80s and 90s and the early of the aughts, um, right? But it was, uh, or, or, you know, all the HBO and Showtime movies that were done. Um, but now it's, it's uh, um, shifted towards uh, uh, extended series because it's easier to market those um, and because the, the difference between a movie for television and a limited series is that a movie, you have to spend a lot of advertising dollars to make people aware of that one time that that yeah. movie is going to be shown. Whereas a limited series, if you, you spend some money on the first episode, and then just that episode itself will market for the second and third and fourth, you know. So it became uh, an economic model that all of the various venues decided to adapt because it was more lucrative to uh, do series instead of just so one if you want to apply, if, if you want to pitch or to, you know, to come with an idea, uh, what do you have to show them for, mini, for a series, for television? What do you have to give them? Because in, in films, you, you know, you, you, a script you. or a synopsis or a script. So, so you have to show them a vision and um, images or anything that you can do to demonstrate the fullness of your vision of what that show is, the better. So whether or not it's Just a pitch deck. I want to ask you something. Every, every time you say them, you have to show them, you have to ask them, who are them? Who are the people that choose well, them? Well, there's executives at every streaming service or network or studio. So there's development executives who are responsible or the heads of programming who are the responsible ones for determining what they're going to green light and put on their schedule. So when so you bring a material, thing. it has to fit in. You cannot bring something first that they would take a chance. How does it? Well, work? they're going to, the, uh, anything that you bring them, they're going to be taking a chance because nobody has any idea what's going to work and what's not going to work, right? But what your job is, is to persuade them that yours will work. Um, there's got to be some hook that, that makes it relevant or that makes it sexy or makes it appealing um, uh, in whatever way that you deem appropriate. Um, uh, you know, there, there are people who are expert far more expert at pitching their concepts than necessarily executing them. That's right. a talent in and of itself. Yes, yes. But the, the answer to your questions really entails having something that describes the fullness of your uh, the world that you your story is set against and the richness and dimension of the characters that you're imagining and the situations that you're putting them in and with some sort of visual support that indicates the tone, um, uh, uh, you know, some comparable um, shows that exist or films that exist that capture a feeling of what the world is that you're trying to capture. And then you have to be able to lay out in your pilot concept what's going to tease the audience and raise enough questions that they're going to be compelled to tune in a second time to see the answers to those questions. So you have to show them a complete answer. pilot? You have to write first a no. complete? No, you, no. I mean, uh, some people do, um, uh, but more often than not, most of these entities want to have a the full concept laid out because they may they want to be able to say, no, let's tweak this, let's do this, let's do that, which is easier in concept stage than in fully executed screenplay, you know? How do you but feel that's about not the, the yeah. How do you feel about the politically correct? Do you think it limits the options or it squeeze it more? No, I think that uh, um, in Hollywood, 
I think not being politically correct is more appealing than being politically correct. You know, I think that uh, um, there are without question all sorts of issues in today's culture that, that uh, you know, come into play. You know, having a middle-aged um, uh, white guy talking about telling a story about an Asian or African-American couple or a woman's story is far harder today than it had been in the past. There would be a greater likelihood to have an Asian telling the Asian story or the woman telling the woman's story, a Black telling an African-American story, um, uh, as everybody's trying to avoid um, offending a certain um, niche of the audience, right? So there's that at play, but the actual content of the stories, I think, is very broad in terms of, uh, you know, um, uh, meeting some of this, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, politically correct notions head on and, and plowing through them and breaking them, you know. Uh, some of the shows are really, really edgy um, that are being created and and that's where the streaming services come in because, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, a, a network wouldn't necessarily tell that story they're because doing, they're yeah. appealing to a broader audience. Whereas a streaming service, anything that catches attention is going to um, be of value to them because they want people talking about good, bad, or indifferent what's going on on their streaming service. Do you it think brings in more subscribers? Do you think the big money with the big stars will stay high or it will go low and they'll have to uh, settle for something? The big Say that again? The big money for the big stars because the budget is changing now. Expenses are changing. Everything becomes uh, more expensive, but the income is not the same. Do you think they'll have to change the rules of payments for the big money, for the big stars? No. No, because oh. why? Why? Because uh, um, there's a reason why they're a big star. And the stars and their representatives know that they're being used they to help the sell. They're, they're, they're bringing the eyeballs, right? Um, the, the, what, one of the things that you're looking for in any um, a feature film or a television series is um, an element that's going to um, mitigate some of the risk. And if you have a star director or a, an actor who's a star or some topic that is a hot button topic or um, a, a, a book that was a bestseller or an article that had won a Pulitzer Prize, all of those and many more um, details uh, or aspects become um, a marketing tool sure. that is to your advantage um, because it says there'll be people interested in that particular topic or person or situation um, uh, that gives them, uh, you know, greater um, assurance that uh, the risk is minimized. So as a producer, um, what makes you choose a director and would you take a first time director? Um, no. Uh, and why oh I wouldn't God. take a first time director. Yeah, because it's so hard to raise money. And just like I was saying with the networks and streaming services, for an independent film, one of the ways in which you get money to finance your film is that you have um, uh, a bank or investors who just like in any other investment that they make, they want some assurance that they're gonna get their money back. And so somebody who is coming off of a film at Sundance or you know, that may have only made one film, um, but that film got some attention uh, or somebody who's done a lot of films is gonna be uh, that have had some box office success, they're gonna, um, reassure the investor to put money into your movie more readily than somebody whom they've never heard of, you know? So um, that, that's just the reality of the business. 
Whereas a first time director, you know, how do they get started? Material, everybody is looking for a piece of, of material, a, a good script that is promising. So if they have a piece of material that um, uh, other people computer. want, I'm sorry? You are moving the computer. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Um, uh, if, if they have a um, piece of material that other people want, then they can attach themselves to that material and that becomes, yeah, right. that becomes- My first thing was with the pre to HBO, Canadian, and I said, it's me with a script. It's a package deal. And this is how I made my first one. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, yeah. it takes a lot of chutzpah. Yeah, it does. But right? you have to start somehow. Right, so right. But you know, but today uh, you take, I don't know, also in America, I can see my students. They are going Indiegogo, they raise money, you know, uh, through Indiegogo or, and, and then they go to everybody they know and ask for, little bit of money to invest and they yep. make the films for low budget you know yeah even which is unheard you know you you had films done in the past feature films for fifty thousand, but that's almost impossible even not you know even in the states i don't think yep. you tried did you try to do an independent passion no. film well i i did actually my first film was with a uh, um uh a well-known actress at the time, Diane Baker, um, yeah. who was in in uh, Hitchcock's Marnie and Diary of Anne Frank and a number of other movies in that era of the 50s um, uh, and, and 60s. Um, and I met her years later, but um, she asked me to write and direct a picture that uh, uh, we produced independently. And that became my calling card that I got started with. But it was a... Uh, an hour long movie that we ultimately sold as an after school special at the time. We didn't make it for that, but uh, um, that was the way in which we sold it to ABC. Um, so that's the closest I came to that. After that, I got involved in the industry. And so uh, I didn't have to raise that financing, although um, I ironically now doing that at this stage of my life as a, a film producer, you know. Yeah, wow. But, but, but more, more expensive, yeah. Uh, how do you find your students at the university? Um, he's a, pro oh, he's professor. a professor at the, NYU. NYU. Right. What do at they tish, care tish. for? What do they care for? What's interesting for them? How do they uh, react towards the older generation and their materials? Well, I mean, it's a wide swath of young people and what, what they bring uh, with them when they come to NYU. Um, uh, so uh, some are steeped in film tradition, but most don't have a clue about the movies that have uh, preceded them. You know, oh. the last 10, 15, 10, 15 years, um, they'll know, hang on a sec. Um, uh, they'll know about, but anything that preceded that, they won't know who the great filmmakers were, who the fil great uh, actors were. And it's not surprising. I mean, when I went to film school many, many years ago at USC, I knew nothing about movies. And going to USC, it was through my peers um, and their love of movies that I learned about movies. And that was probably the biggest takeaway um, out of my time there. So, um, on the one hand, they don't have that sense of history and um, therefore don't have the ability to stand on the shoulders of the giants that preceded them. So where do they and take their the pictorial the, vision? Say that again? Where do they take their pictorial vision? Or, you know. From, from, I was thinking about this just yesterday, um, from their, the best of them, from their um, personal experience. The handful that are actually the best are doing that. The others are um, uh, replicating romantic comedies or love relationships and things that are very superficial and familiar. Um, but I, I, I will say that um, as I look back on the best of the films over the last few years that I've been here, um, it's always been about identity. How, does, how do I fit in? 
you know, whether or not it's a uh, African American young woman uh, trying to find a, 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 you know, what is her role after college? If it was a uh, uh, his uh, la Latino male who was trying to figure out, um, having immigrated here from Colombia, how do I fit in? Um, to uh, this new world where I have to make compromises and still want to make a name for myself, you know, um, uh, if it was, uh, uh, um, uh, there, there was a, a, a story that just is being completed now about um, a, a, a person who made a robot who, uh, uh, in, the, in the form of their son, whom they had lost, um, who uh, uh, she was testing the artificial intelligence by sending it to high school and see if it could fit in. And he learns to be human. So all of these stories are united by the theme of, which I understand um, with young people, trying to figure out what their place is in life, you know, how to be more human, you know. And, but the other thing I'd say about the uh, uh, running thread throughout the stories that they're telling recently is they're more violent. You know, I think the the oh. anxiety mm. of of having lived through the pandemic, um, and sometimes it's manifest that violence through humor, sometimes through drama, but but there's a a, a, a spike in the um, violent reactions of some of the characters um, that I really attribute to the um, uh, the challenges that so many of young people have had just uh, finding their way during this time. But I also think that their processing is shorter and faster and they need, the, it's a little bit rough on the edges to really get through. Um, it, because they, they are interested in the same story, just the language of expressing the stories and the rhythm is very different. What is the, the most common- uh, Don't move the, 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 you're touching the screen or something? The most yeah, no, it's on my knee. Well, it's so on your knees. Yeah. Oh, it's like a handheld camera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the most common criticism that they have for towards the older generation? Well, I, I really haven't encountered that um, quite candidly uh, in terms of, of, of have you Zippy? No, I mean we showed them films uh, that they never saw, including the what you call the giants. And they like 99% of them. And uh, when you ask them to analyze the film, even at the end of freshmen, they're already capable of really taking it apart in terms of cinematic elements, content, through line. Uh, so I was surprised. I didn't have an experience of not liking the films or criticizing. Uh, I, I, I'm actually, now that you ask, I'm amazed, uh, actually. But, this but is the first asking, time I treat freshmen in the last two uh, years, and I wasn't used to. And I find I can, well, I always try to talk in no eye level with them. But I am amazed now that they have assignments and they have to do presentations. Uh, I'm very proud of them. But you're, you're asking, though, about older generation like ourselves, right. whether or not they, they respect us or don't respect us or how they feel about us whatsoever. Is that what you're asking? I think. Look, they have a very different point of view. Uh, of course, if they come to school and they see you guys who made it, uh, they have a lot of respect and you know they get into a different mood. But I, I'm sure that they have some criticism towards the, the done material and they want to express it differently or they have some other ideas about it. Well, the only thing I encounter is that, um, you know, periodically, uh, not infrequently, there's a student that comes and says, I, I, I want to change things up. I don't want to do a three act structure, you know, or, or I, I don't want to tell a movie in the way in which movies have been told. And invariably, what they create is a mess. Um, and it, I think it's just part of youth where they want to be different. But I, what I try to impose, not impose, but impart to them, is that uh, you have to learn the rules in order to then be able to break them, you know? And so here, while they're at school, um, their, their goal should be to um, understand 
why these rules exist and what values they have, and then they can do whatever they want um, once once I do that and share with them Picasso or any number of other right. artists they, who they started don't know anything. With, right. You know, right. Who, who, who started uh, with classical training and then ended up finding their own voice and vision, you know? But I, I don't find them disrespectful, you know, maybe they're one or two over the years, but uh, for the most part, um, uh, they, they see the value of, they, they come here to learn. Yeah, but how do, they, how do you think new technology is going to affect content? Oh, oh he, easy. Well, 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 well. Uh, the easy answer to that is um, nothing will ever undermine the importance or preeminence of story. No, no technology right. will ever uh, replace the um, prioritization of telling a good story and understanding how to tell a good story. The uh, technology is merely a tool to tell that story, right? So there'll be different ways in which we tell uh, different tools that we use to tell the story. Um, and that's changing continually um, and will always evolve and probably with greater rapidity. Um, you know, for right now, for example, there's virtual production is the new flavor of the month, you know, where, where they go into a stage and project on 180 degree or, or law, wider um, LED screens, whole worlds like the Mandalorian, um, and then place actors in front of it. And they don't have to do green screen. They've already got the, um, a, a CGI generated world that the characters are, are set against. So you're able to actually see um, uh, uh, that character in that world through the camera lens instead of waiting until post-production when the VFX are done. Do you know what I'm referring to? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, which I couldn't do. So, yeah, what? I couldn't do. <laughs> I cannot do this anymore. I have to do what you do. I have to rely on the story yeah. and conventional well, well, technology. Well, the, the good thing is, is that, you know, that still has a good story and you hire people who do know that stuff and you would be able to use it because just like with a DP, you don't have to right. handle the camera. Right. You're yeah. relying on yeah. them to handle yeah. the technical side yeah. of it uh, to yeah. help you tell your story. You know? Do you think they are a, a, a look around the world and actually tell stories that either have analogy to reality or are relevant, not just to, you know, because they live in a very chaotic, you know, world. And the question how much they develop consciousness uh, and social awareness and uh, all their uh, uh, so students. Ask, I, I was studying. Ask, 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 que ask that question again. I, I missed the first part of that. Well, I wonder to what degree, whatever, even, you know, I will even go further. Those who commission or pick up materials, are, yeah, are they interested in stories that are relevant to what's happening? in the real world? Uh, I, I would say, like anything else, there are people who are without question interested in that. You know, uh, you look, look around and, I, you know, you see um, uh, stories, uh, uh, you know, about gay relationships or, or political, uh, you know, uh, think about um, don't look up, don't look up. You know, yes. even though whatever the problems with the movie, it was still trying to tackle an important, relevant subject. You know, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a movie coming out about Oppenheimer um, uh, and a nuclear bomb being created. Right. You know, what what could be more relevant? And then you're looking, you know, you're looking around the world too. Um, at films that have been made, but that's another conversation because the films that come to the United States from elsewhere right. many times are really um, hot button subjects yeah, um, yeah. And, and relevant to the moment. But that's a long you story know. about foreign films in America, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah, no. Ab it was absolutely. never a big celebration. But tell me, our students now have much more platforms. When we, when we started, you know, but now they have so many platforms, it's, it's like mind blowing. And the yep. question if they will target the stories to a platform, like, you know, like they will go to, to one platform and tell them we are looking for that. So they will go and try to do that and not really 
coming from their own, you know, corner of their well, soul and mind. I, I, I think I, I had developed a project several years ago now, and uh, it was a television series. And uh, um, the company that financed the development of the project, we were going out to the networks to purchase it. This is before the streaming services, right? And every network had a different ag agenda, wow. a different um, branding element that they wanted their material infused with, right? So we had to change the pitch for every network that we went to, oh. right? And, and um, the point of that story is that um, it's not, we, we live in the real world. If you want to be dealing with a large <clears throat> um, audience, you want to know the market that you're creating for so that you're not totally creating in a vacuum. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to censor the stories that you tell, but the nuances of the way, the focus of the stories that you tell may change based on the uh, uh, entity that you intend to bring it to. If you, if you go to HBO Max, it's gonna be different than if you go to Disney Plus, do you know? Right. Um, and so you have to be aware of the fact, am I telling the story for HBO Max or am I telling mm -hmm. it for Disney Plus? And then, um, uh, 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 you know, you'll make certain choices, but it won't necessarily, it might change the tone of what you do, but it won't necessarily tell the thrust of the story that you want to tell. Now, there might be certain stories where you definitely want to, you know, Fleabag wouldn't be for Disney Plus. Um, uh, 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 sex education wouldn't be for um, Disney Plus. So there might be certain subject matter that you, um, uh, uh, definitely know that you want it to go to a certain market that won't go to another one, you know? I think there are enough places for everybody because there are so many channels and you can yeah. find your own way. Yeah. And there's, there are enough, there's enough audience for each one. So I don't think this can, uh, should be a problem. But tell me, um, as a Jew, do you feel that there is any anti-Semitism in the industry? Because everybody's talking about uh, the uh, rise of anti-Semitism. Is there? I fortunately have not experienced that. And because there are so many Jews in the business, you know, uh, and in executive positions in the business, I don't experience that when selling projects. Now, there's always the you know the situation where you get into uh, um, talking about a subject, and 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 somebody who actually is Jewish says, "Well, that's a little bit too Jewish," you know, um, and you encounter that kind of right. <clears throat> um, anti-Semitism. So, Jews among Jews, I I know, I understand. You know, this is uh, yeah. we're Israelis, so we know. But um, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the thing is that because of the amount of Jewish people in the industry? Do you think that the, the outside people are very upset about the fact that Jews are in like ruling? Oh. Okay? Because I don't know that they're ruling the industry. So they're, they're hardly ruling the industry, that's but right. there's no question that's been a unfortunate uh, 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 bit of, of prejudice that's existed long before there were there was television or or movies you know it would have been they ruled theater they ruled the arts or whatever you know uh they ruled the music world um uh in germany you know in the 40s so it it's it's uh, an unfortunate um horrible trope that we all have to deal with and as to whether or not it's increased I, I don't think it's been increased. I think it's been uncovered, unleashed, let me put it that way, by the Trump years, yes. um, where now people have uh, felt empowered to express what they had previously held silent for fear yes. of retribution, you yeah, know. Mm -hmm. And so it's far more public now, you know, in its own horrifying way. Um, but it's better to have it out in the open 
than to have it uh, um, hidden, hidden because then you can least um, know um, how, how to address it. it straight on. Yeah. Right. So what do you like more, producing, writing, or directing? Um, well, listen, I think the uh, prospect of creating and collaborating with creative minds is glorious and a privilege that cannot be underestimated in any, through any means whatsoever. So um, uh, uh, any opportunity to tell a story and work with some really wonderful people to take pure energy and give it form um, uh, for others to see is a glorious enterprise, right? Talk about, as you began looking for inspiration, just the opportunity to continue to create is what gives our lives a focus and meaning um, and uh, uh, you know, a source of joy, no matter how frustrating it can be. You know? um, in terms of my own personal preference, um, uh, I love the idea of writing because you have total control over the world that you've created as to whether or not it gets to the screen is another matter altogether. Um, uh, and I love directing because I love gathering people together and challenging myself and others to bring the best of themselves forward. And if it's a story that's of uh, meaning to me, um, uh, there's an even greater uh, incentive to uh, prevail despite whatever the obstacles that we inevitably encounter in trying to make anything in this world, you know. Right, right. But but you mentioned uh, get people together to, to do their best. Do their best to your vision as a director? Well, you know what? I learned many, many years ago. Um, uh, I, I, would, uh, I was at a certain peak of my career where um, I'd work and, and uh, um, I go to work and the prop person or the costume person or the set dresser or whomever wasn't sort of meeting up to my standards, you know, and I'd get frustrated with them and I'd get irritated and as a director. feel badly as a director, right? And, and I, I was driving home one night and I was saying, this is not sustainable what is going on here? And I realized that um, in my pursuit of getting my vision up on the screen, I was missing one of the most important aspects of this process. And I said that the real creative work wasn't what was going up on the screen. It was what I was uh, doing in interacting with the people. Um, and so if my focus shifted from what was on the screen to the people I was engaged with, everything else would unfold from there. And, and what I realized is that at that point in time in my life, I, I had had a, enough experience and most of the people that were around me hadn't had the same experience I had. So I had the opportunity to share with them and mentor them to get to a different level in the um, manifestation of their craft. And that was the most gratifying aspect of all. And inevitably that made my relationships with the people so much better, better. our experiences so much more Thank enjoyable, and that would reflect um, itself in the final product. I'm going you know? to use this point of view in my class, but finally, because we, we have to, to, to let you go, Silly, you know his wife, right? And not personally, but you know. No, I, I know her face of and course. I know her from a- Right, you are married series, to yeah. quite a lady, yeah. <laughs> uh, quite a famous actress. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, is that a question or a statement? <laughs> the, the statement <laughs> and the question probably will come out the next time we meet, which will, I think, again <laughs> after your next project. Really, okay. That was something, huh? Harry, thank you so much. It was really it's very, a pleasure very interesting. getting a chance to see you and, and Zippy, hopefully in person next time. Yes. Ah, yeah, we have. We have some kind of uh, lunch together. On Waverly. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll yeah. make sure I'm with you. 
Okay. okay. Thank I'm you so to much. Stop now, otherwise, you'll have everybody. Just tell him happy, you. happy, happy, happy uh, holiday. Happy, happy Pass holiday over. for everybody. Yeah. Everybody. Okay. Everybody. And next week we'll see you again, guys. In Tuzamen. Thank you so much for coming. Bye, everybody. Bye, Tilly. Thank you. Bye, bye, Thanks, bye. Yeah. Bye, bye. Don't go. Yeah. Bye.